So that's a, a big build up and uh, um, I'll see if I can live up to it. I'll, I'll start actually by thanking Svi in particular, Harold and Holger Becker for inviting me here and uh, I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to come and speak here. So I'm from uh, Glasgow University and uh, originally was in electronic engineering department and we've moved into this area of biomedical engineering and we have as, uh, as, as the chairman said in the introduction spent the last 10, 15 years or so developing sensor technologies, primarily biosensor technologies and he alluded to the fact that we've spun these out into uh, a company and, and so in the last uh, I suppose uh, two to three years I've become very interested in this area of uh, developing world diagnostics and we see one of the reasons why uh, one can be interested in this is really because of some of the demands that, that it puts upon you. So there is, a, there is clearly the humanitarian aspect of uh, wanting to do better for the world. But at the same time, there are some very challenging engineering aspects to uh, developing diagnostics for, for the developing world. So if we look at... Uh, how the world is divided. There are really uh, two worlds, of course. And uh, in, in the developed world, most of us will die from chronic diseases. And in the developing world, most people will die from infectious diseases. And uh, those figures are quite stark when you look at uh, the statistics behind them. So 40% of people will die before the age of 14 in low-income countries whereas 70% of what is largely us will survive beyond the age of 70, with perhaps only 1% of children dying before 14. So that's quite a, uh, a, a dramatic uh, backdrop to the, to the uh, picture. And in fact, if we look at those deaths, most of these deaths come from five major diseases. So tuberculosis, malaria, pneumonia, and then the rotavirus, which are associated with dysentery and, and um, uh, inability to control water. And then clearly HIV, which in the developed world is a disease that does not lead to death, whereas in, in the developing world is a disease which kills many people. And so we are actually working on uh, both malaria and tuberculosis, although I'm not going to talk about the tuberculosis work in, in, in this talk at all. The other area that we're working on is one of the so-called neglected diseases. So there are a whole range of diseases which don't get so much uh, uh, funding or so much activity focused on them. Uh, these mainly filarial worm diseases such as uh, bilharzia and river blindness and the like. And we are working in particular upon sleeping sickness that is caused by a protozoan parasite uh, called the uh, uh, trypanosome, and that's transmitted by a vector with a tsetse fly. So just as a as sort of a side to this, which is something quite interesting, that although I've been in the States for a couple of days, I picked up on the BBC, actually, that the UK government has just announced... Uh, quite a substantial funding, about somewhere around about $350 million to try to eliminate river blindness and, and have focused specifically on that disease and the, the dreadful sort of consequences that that disease has in, in Africa. So if we look at the techniques which are currently available in developing world diagnostics, then a lot of these tend to be uh, fairly simple technologies. So in the context of malaria, what will typically happen will be a blood smear and a stain, and then that will be observed under the microscope to look for the plasmodium within the red blood cells. And similarly in sleeping sickness, which would be the other area that I'm going to talk about today, um, you can see that uh, in fact the demands for detection in sleeping sickness are such that the there is typically at the lowest levels of parasitemia, which you need to be able to measure, you have somewhere around about one parasite per 100 million 
cells, 100 million blood cells. So that's a signal to noise of about 1 to 10 to the 8. So that's quite demanding. So you can see here, actually, that um, there is a, a little chromatic, chromatographic exchange column that is used to concentrate, the, selectively concentrate the parasites um, before they're observed under a microscope. And that might sound like a, a, a very successful type of technology. It works pretty well. And it was with some interest, actually, that working with FIND, which is the Foundation for Innovative and Novel Diagnostic Technologies, that they were telling me that these ion exchange columns are made by students within the chemistry department of Dar es Salaam University. And sometimes they're available, sometimes they're not. So that's really the state of diagnostics in, in much of the developing world. And so the challenges are, are manifold. The challenges include, for example, um, this, this signal-to-noise problem of being able to detect the, uh, the, the, the plasmodium or the, the trypanosome, the protosome, parasites, whatever, against a large background. Power and infrastructure, I mean, these images, I think, get across the idea that uh, one can't even rely upon a microscope to be able to do this type of diagnostic. Um, fixed landlines for phones don't exist. Uh, costs have to be minimum. The ambient conditions are really quite severe. 30 degrees, perhaps 80% humidity or more. And that maybe doesn't sound too bad if you're considering trying to store a sensor. But actually, if your sensor gets left out on the airport tarmac, then those temperatures will escalate very much higher. If, it gets, if your sensors get lost in a warehouse somewhere, then the stability issues for the reagents that you might be using are really quite, quite severe. And then, of course, we've got the need to be able to use these uh, these diagnostics easily, the availability of the samples, whether they be blood, urine, or saliva, and, and actually um, saliva is quite a, quite a difficult uh, media to use. It's very, very variable. So you have blood or, or urine. And ultimately, as I hope I'll be able to show, we need to be able to look at more information than just is a parasite or is an infectious disease present. And one of the major challenges which we as a country, as a, a, a world are going to face over the coming uh, 10, maybe even less years, is going to be in the context of drug resistance within these in, infectious diseases. So already within tuberculosis, there are strains of extensive drug resistance occurring. Within malaria, there are now spots, particularly on the Thailand-Cambodia border, where, where the malarial parasite is showing resistance. And this is partly because of overtreatment of the disease, and that sounds a little bit of a paradox, but uh, people have been given drugs prophylactically at the wrong dose, and this has begun to lead to the, the, the problem of uh, drug resistance. So, as you'll see as the talk develops, we're interested in particular in can we get some molecular information out of the, uh, out of the sensing. So, what's going on at the moment? Well, at the moment, uh, there, there are a, a number of different approaches being taken within the developed world to develop diagnostics for the developing world. And clearly, at this conference, in fact, there have been, there's been quite a lot on uh, already, sorry, about, um, about uh, the use of mobile phones as microscopes. And at the other end of the spectrum, there's the ultra-low cost, very amenable paper microfluidic technologies being developed by others, um, George Whiteside's amongst many other people. So we're interested actually in the, in the mobile phone, but not in the same way as using it as a microscope, but uh, rather just considering that in Africa there are 500 million, half a billion mobile phones. Now, there are many, many different types of mobile phone, and those will range in age from 
maybe up-to-date ones to ones which are legacy phones, maybe 10, 15 years old. And so we see the mobile phone more as a rechargeable power supply. As we think it's unlikely that you're going to be able to use LEDs or um, the camera on the phone reliably. And it's most likely, actually, that the individual the, who's going to do the test is going to be someone in a clinic or in a, in, in a hospital rather than it being the, the diagnostic being devolved down to the individual at a point of care. So, and of course, that is just our, our way of looking at this, and others have a different view on this. And, and so we would see the phone really as a power supply, and then we would just become more interested in doing low-power diagnostics. So what we've been, uh, what we're interested in, I've mentioned the three diseases that we're working on at the moment, so malaria, sleeping sickness, tuberculosis. I'm going to focus first on malaria and then on sleeping sickness. And in doing this, I'm going to look at two different technologies, one involving acoustics and the other involving uh, a, a, a field called dielectrophoresis. And dielectrophoresis is the way in which uh, particles, including cells, become polarized within electric fields. And in particular, we're going to look about, at how we can induce these electric fields optically using a, a, a very low power uh, technique. So the first half of the talk, or the first third of the talk, is going to focus on um, acoustics, and we're going to look in particular at aspects of malarial detection. So here we have a, a, a cartoon, and I chose this cartoon from a magazine that we have in the UK called Punch, or used to have anyway, a very funny magazine. But we can see here that there's a, what, what we have here is an a, um, ear trumpet, and of course, this ear trumpet has a couple of roles. One is that it is cutting out the background, so were this dog to be barking, the grandfather here would be less likely to, uh, to be disturbed by that. And the second is that it is somehow focusing the uh, voice of the, of the child to the ear. So the idea of being able to shape acoustic fields is one which is familiar to us. And the idea that acoust acoustics contain energy and mechanical energy, again, is something that's very familiar. So because we're particularly interested in sensing, we, we look at acoustics on surfaces, and in particular, we look at these so-called surface acoustic wave devices. And here you see a very simple diagram of a, uh, a surface acoustic wave device where we have patterned onto a piezoelectric surface, in this case lithium niobate, some microelectrodes, a pair of interdigitated microelectrodes that is uh, uh, fabricated onto the surface. And we can uh, see that when we apply a potential across a unit cell, then we're going to get a mechanical displacement, and that mechanical displacement is going to result in an acoustic wave that's going to propagate across the surface um, with an aperture which is defined by the, by the width of the electrodes and with a uh, frequency which is defined by the spacing between the microelectrodes. So that's all well established, and of course these are widely used in consumer technologies, not least mobile phones. So what becomes then interesting is what happens when you put fluid into the path of that surface acoustic wave. And clearly at this point we could uh, digress into a, a, a talk which really focused just on the physics of what goes on at this, uh, in, in this situation. There is uh, this uh, wonderful quote by Fermi about uh, uh, the interfaces and and God, gave, uh, God took the solid state and he left the interfaces to the devil. And, and uh, really, we have three interfaces here. We have an interface with the chip, and we have an interface with the air, and we have an interface with the liquid. And in fact, as you'll see, it becomes more complicated because we're going to change the format of this a little bit later on uh, in, 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 to, to create even more interfaces. <clears throat> 
So we know that there are going to be some electrical properties associated with the formation or the generation of the uh, acoustic wave. The voltage, for instance, is going to say something about the magnitude of the wave, and the frequency is going to say something about the power density that we're putting into the wafer. And then clearly there is going to be some internal friction within that wafer, and that's going to cause heating, which might be something that we want, or it might be something that we don't want to uh, happen, and I'll discuss that in a, in a moment. We've then got a, a, an interface with the, the, w between the wafer and the droplet, and in fact, where this acoustic wave impinges into the, um, into the droplet, there is going to be an acoustic impedance mismatch, and as a consequence of that, we're going to get reflection and refraction of the wave, and that's going to start to cause streaming within the, within the wave, and that's going to start the, the fluid moving. And then even with the interface with the fluid of the liquid fluid and the air is going to result in some uh, quite interesting phenomena, including capillary waves, which are going to propagate across the surface. So quite a lot is going on there. And then the droplet itself, which might be simply water, or it might be uh, the sample, which you're interested in analyzing, is going to have some internal uh, say in how the streaming occurs. So something that's very viscous is going to damp your, your, your acoustic wave. And in addition, you're going to have uh, a surface tension interface as well, which is quite an quite a interesting phenomenon. Notwithstanding that, we don't actually work on the, on the, on the piezoelectric. There is a, a difficulty with doing that, which is that uh, the lithium niobate is quite a tractable, intractable material. It's quite difficult to process. So what we do is we put onto the surface of a piezoelectric a disposable, and what we call it a superstrate. So the, the lithium niobate is a substrate, and we simply place onto that surface a, 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 a disposable chip, which is a chip that we're going to use. And in fact, the little movie that's running here is just showing the interaction of a surface acoustic wave on a piezoelectric surface with a, a, a glass uh, cover slip put on top. And what is happening is a rally wave that's propagating out across our lithium niobate wafer is coupling into that very thin plate that's put onto the surface. And then as a consequence of that, it's propagating as a, a LAM wave within our within the disposable, which can be taken away and removed. And so we use a, a variety of different superstrates, and these can vary from silicon or glass. We can use ceramics, some, some of the harder polymers, and indeed we're beginning to look at the moment as to whether we can use paper as a, as a, as a, a material. It, this depends largely upon the stiffness of the, of, of the superstrate, and what we do need is, is, is stiffness. So I spoke a moment ago about shaping the uh, acoustic field. And of course, within consumer electronics, it's known that you can shape acoustic fields. So we have this nice technology which exists, which has been used extensively over the last five years or so, called um, phenonic crystals. And these phenonic crystals are um, structures which are made in the case of consumer electronics, into the lithium niobate wafer in order to uh, shape the acoustic uh, activity on, on the piezoelectric. So we're not, of course, working on the piezoelectric surface. We're working on a superstrate. So what we would tend to do is to make these structures by simple micro-machining or by molding into our superstrate. And you can see just some very simple modeling, some of the first modeling that we did with a multi-physics multi package of what the kind of thing that we can do. And the analogy for those of you who are involved in optics with photonic crystals is uh, one that you shouldn't miss here. So we have a, a surface acoustic wave that's propagating. We have a very, very simple phenonic structure, which is a series of holes which are drilled within the superstrate. And at uh, low frequencies, these are transparent. We go to a higher frequency, and we get what is, in effect, an acoustic mirror. 
and then at a higher frequency still, then this becomes transparent again. And so we have a frequency-dependent ability to, to shape that acoustic wave. And in fact, if we do more substantial modeling, we can see that we can create band gap structures, and those were perhaps the first structures that we made, which again were, the, these were in silicon substrates, to, which were, our initial work was based on, where we, um, we machined holes into the, into the superstrate, and the dimension of the hole gave you a, a band gap, in this case some t somewhere between 15 and 16 megahertz. We have since then done a lot of modeling, and we've pushed hard on the modeling, and the modeling is the key to the success that we've had in creating a variety of different uh, 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 structures and devices. And so here in, in a glass plate, we have a, um, a, a propagation of a surface acoustic wave. We've made a band gap structure here, and so we have complete attenuation of the acoustic wave occurring within that structure, whereas we have propagation of the acoustic wave occurring here. And we can see that this band gap is, exists where there are no modes being supported. None of the acoustic modes are being supported within that structure. And the multiple reflections which are occurring are, are attenuating the, the propagation process. We can go on and make resonators and waveguides, and uh, we have a particular interest in waveguides. And, and um, again, in an analogy with, um, uh, with, with photonics, you can see that you can make graded index lenses where, for example, you're able to focus the acoustic energy down into a, a, a position. And this is particularly useful, as we'll see, in a situation where we might want to for example, heat up a sample. So we might want to put a drop of fluid there, and we might want to see that being heated, heated up. So where does this leave us? Well, most of microfluidics and the whole lab on a chip community is largely about uh, the, the concept of flow, and you have flow down a channel, and at different points along that channel, which correspond to different times at a constant flow rate, for example, different things would happen to that sample. And that's really a paradigm that has existed within microfluidics or lab on a chip for 10 or 20 years or so. So what we potentially have the ability to do here is something that's slightly different, which is to be able to take um, a stationary droplet so not worry about moving our droplet around, but instead of that, to create structures which are able to perform different functions on, on that droplet. So now that brings us to the point where we start to look at some of the applications. And you can see here that um, we're interested in malaria. And malaria is, of course, as many of you will know, transmitted by the mosquito, and it enters our blood and then resides largely within uh, red blood cells, which change their nature. They become uh, sticky and ultimately very diseased. And the ideal would be to be able to detect the nature of that plasmodium within the red blood cell. And in fact, the challenge is not just counting red blood cells or counting red blood cells which are sticky or diseased, but also trying to get some feel of the nature of the plasmodium within inside the red blood cell. Coming back to this point that I made about uh, drug resistance. You need to know what drugs you're, and in, increasingly in the future we're going to have to know what drugs we're going to give to people um, in order to treat them successfully and indeed how me what dosage of drugs to give them. So if we just run back to um, to uh, the idea of having the, the band stop, the band gap structure. Here's, here's our, our lithium niobate wafer. We've got a dis disposable superstrate on here. We've got our band gap in here, and we put a drop of blood on, on this spot. And then what is going to happen here, of course, is that we, if we put the drop at the apex here, then we are going to have a mechanical wave which is going to impinge upon the drop, and it's going to introduce orbital angular momentum into that drop. And so we see that happening here. 
where we take a drop of blood and we can first make a, a little centrifuge out of this, so we're spinning this down. And in fact, if we set up the right conditions here, we can get streaming to occur, and, and between the streams that, that exist, we have um, shear, and that shear results in the breakdown of the cells. And it not only opens up the red blood cells, but it also opens up our white blood cells and also the plasmodium within the, within the red blood cells. So um, this is, for the integration of the malarial diagnostic, what we want to be able to do is take our sample, perform a lysis, and then do a, a, a commonly used bi biochemical technique, which is called um, uh, PCR amplification, polymerase chain reaction, and I'll show that in a moment, and then detect the, uh, the, detect the DNA. So um, many of you will know of PCR, some of you will not know of it. Kerry Mullis from uh, California, of course, got the Nobel Prize for it. And it's a technique that's used throughout biochemistry, used in forensics in particular for taking small amounts of DNA and amplifying it into larger amounts of DNA. And to do that, we use a thermal cycle, and that thermal cycle involves heating the DNA duplex up to 90 degrees, at which point it melts, it becomes two single strands. It then has a possibility to, uh, you have the possibility to use a polymerase enzyme to build a new strand of DNA, which requires that you cool down the, the, the DNA strand. So each heating and cooling cycle results in a doubling of the amount of DNA. So what we found is that by using our, our little focusing device, we can actively heat and then passively cool our DNA so that in a process of about 15 minutes, we can run 30 PCR cycles. And at the moment, we're doing the detection quite simply using these very nice hydrolysis probes in uh, doing real-time PCR, and you can see that the amount of DNA is being uh, copied up to a much larger amount of DNA. Now, given the safety constraints of working with plasmodium, we're working with a, a mouse plasmodium, which is called Plasmodium burgi, and uh, this will involve taking quite literally finger prick type or, or paw pick, paw prick, um, sorry, it's a, it's a good one, that. Uh, <laughs> poor prick of blood and, um, and then doing this cycling. And we can see that uh, not only can we get quite a, quite a nice sensitivity, so the sensitivity there is about 0.07% parastemia, which would correspond to round about 10 plasmodium within our drop of blood containing... 100 million or so uh, red blood cells. Um, and uh, we can confirm, actually, that we have got the, uh, the right uh, DNA being amplified by just doing this uh, simple gel elect electrophoresis technique where we're separating the DNA out based upon its charge and then seeing quite clearly the plasmodium DNA sitting here as opposed to there being none there for the uninfected mouse. So just to sort of conclude that aspect of what we've been doing in acoustics, and that's really just a, a, a small introduction to the work that I could have spoken about, for example, in tuberculosis. Um, we have um, quite a nice system there where we feel that we can use, uh, we can now integrate our, our, our PCR into a, a handheld device, we can run about 12 PCR reactions off a, a single charge of a mobile phone. There's a possibility of introducing multiplexed analysis, so perhaps a holy grail in developing world diagnostics would be to be able to do diagnosis at the point of care, so when someone comes to you to be able to tell whether the fever and the chest infection is as a result of tuberculosis, pneumonia, or malaria, for example. So there is that possibility of using molecular information to attain that. And then most importantly of all, I think, it's extremely important to be able to look at these, um, drug, this drug resistance. So 
In the last 10 or 15 minutes or so, I'm just going to say a little bit about now about a completely different technology that we're developing to, to, to look at sleeping sickness. And this is based upon, as I said, this technique called dielectrophoresis. And many of you will be aware of a concept or the idea that you can put uh, charge onto, uh, onto insulating particles, and as a result of that, there will be some forces which are generated. And so if we put, our, if we put charge or we put an insulating particle into a non-uniform electric field, what we will find is that um, as a consequence of the, the, the field, there will be different charge on different parts of the particle, and so we will have movement of that particle within that non-uniform field. And if we look at the equations that uh, govern this, so if we're looking at an AC field and we're looking at the real part here, we will see that there, this is firstly frequency dependent, and secondly that the force is going to be dependent upon the permittivity of the, of the particle with respect to the medium, which is often, of course, water, that that particle might be sitting in. Now, just to complicate this, of course, if we, put, if we have a, a, a particle that's being exposed to a, a dielectric uh, force in, in a fluid, there are going to be other um, forces taking place as well, not least buoyancy, gravity, and, of course, a viscous force of, or, or the, the viscosity of the, uh, of the fluid that we're, we're in. And I'll probably come back to this point at, at the end. So then if we look at simply what happens to cells within this non-uniform electric field, we will see, and here we have some, uh, a mixture of human cells, including a model for breast cancer cells and some um, mammalian cells mixed together, we can see that the cells move within this electric field. So here we have the, the real part of the electric field, which is telling us something about the magnitude of the force that's being exerted. And here we have the imaginary component, which is telling us something about the phase of this. So if we just concentrate on the, on the, on the real part here, then we can see that we have, uh, to begin with, a negative force, and this is negative dielectrophoresis, which is pushing the cells away from the surface of the electrode. And then as we increase the frequency of the electric field, we get to a crossover point where there's no force, and then we go to positive dielectrophoresis, where in fact the, the cells are then being attracted to the surface. And this movie's in a loop, and you can see nicely what's happening there. So we're interested in looking at the, um, the sleeping sickness, and this is uh, one of these so-called neglected diseases. At worst, it will kill 30,000 people a year. Uh, it, it's found exclusively in sub-Saharan Africa. It's nearly always fatal. It's transmitted by the tsetse fly. When, if you are infected, it almost always results in, um, in, in, in death. And the drugs can't be given prophylactically because the treatment is really a titration of arsenic against the patient, and it's a question of whether the patient dies before the, the um, protozoan dies within your blood. And so about 8% of people who are treated die from the, the treatment itself. So actually getting a, a good diagnostic is quite important, and it was shown during the early 1960s that actually if you do diagnosis and there was an extensive diagnostic that took place, you can almost eradicate the disease. The primary vector is the, 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 the human, so this can be done. So here we have some blood, and we, um, we've set up four electrodes here, and we've got a phase difference between these uh, electrodes, and we're looking at the way in which blood and trypanosomes behave in electric fields. Now, I apologize if you can't see this fully, but if we just concentrate here on the real component, i.e. magnitude of the force, you can see that the trypanosome first experiences a negative dielectrophoretic force. It goes through a crossover and then experiences a positive dielectrophoretic force. And the blood does exactly the same, but at a slightly shifted frequency. 
So there's a window of opportunity that sits between here, round about 160 or so um, hertz, uh, megahertz, where you have the possibility of uh, getting the trypanosome to move in one direction and the blood to move in the opposite direction. And this is really what our little ion exchange column was trying to do right at the beginning, to attenuate one and make the other move. So what we, d what we do is we set up a very simple uh, electrode system, and this electrode system has a phase difference in it. So we're applying our AC field 90 degrees out of phase to four electrodes, which make up a spiral. And then as a consequence of that, there is a, a wave which is traveling across the surface of this and um, is uh, causing the cells to move. And when we see how these cells move, we will see that um, the blood immediately begins to stream outwards and you'll see the blood moving away there. And um, after what takes about five minutes or so, you will see that the trypanosomes become focused down into the center of the device. So if we want to find out the mechanism by which that works, then we do some, some modeling. And that modeling shows us that for the in-phase relationship for the parasite, we have a negative dielectrophoretic force that's pulling, the, um, pulling the, the parasite down onto the surface, and the in-phase component for the, for the red blood cells are pushing the red blood cells away from the surface. Now, if we look at the second imaginary component, the outer phase component, we can see the net result of the forces of that mean that we have, away from the surface, we have streaming in one direction, and at the surface, we have streaming in, in the opposite direction. So we have a counter flow that's being set up. So when we combine all the overall forces there, the, we see that what's happening to the, to the um, red blood cells is that they're being pushed upwards, away from the surface, and away like this, whereas the trypanosomes are being drawn down to the surface and pushed in this direction. So the consequence of that, if you take your chip, is that you can see at the end of uh, running a, an experiment like this, you will have all of your trypanosomes sitting in the middle, and you'll have your red blood cells being, having been excluded out of the device. So that's going to form the basis of a, a device which we're hoping actually to, through the Gates Foundation to have the opportunity to take out to Kenya later this year. So the, since the is primarily an optics conference, I thought I'd say a little bit about some optics towards the end. And there was a very, very nice piece of work that was done by uh, Ming Wu at Berkeley about uh, five, six years ago or so, where he did light-induced dielectrophoresis, and these have often also been called optoelectronic tweezers. And so what, it, what he's doing here is he's, he's projecting an image, and this image is actually a movie which he's projecting onto a photoconductor, and that photoconductor, where light is impinging, of course, is becoming conducting, and as a consequence of that, we can have an AC electric field which is going to give us our gradient force as we might ex expect. So <clears throat> we can set these up and this is um, rather a, an elaborate version of what could be a much more simplified device. We have a, a polysilicon surface, we have an ITO electrode, light is shining through this and we're doing dielectrophoresis. And so what we thought would happen was, was that something that would be pretty well what we would happen at the solid microelectrodes that we'd already made. But actually what happened was something quite different. So here is um, a movie on the left-hand side here, or, yeah, left-hand side here, and uh, we're shining light, we're producing a dielectrophoretic force, and you can see, it, I mean, it actually looks like the trypanosomes are swimming towards the light. They're not, of course. What they're doing is they're feeling a gradient force, and that, that is attracting them into the light here. And you can see that, or you will see, that, um, that uh, you can concentrate or enrich the sample relatively easily 
like this. And we can move them around as well, which we do with light. So that's rather nice. What we didn't expect to see was that at different conditions, we can get the red blood cells to lies. So here is um, a movie showing uh, red blood cells with trypanosomes in, albeit diluted. This is uh, unpublished early work at the moment. But what you can see is that with a, a flash of light like this, that you are able to lyse away your red blood cells and what you're left behind with... Is this movie not running? Try again. I'm just uh, running a bit over time. Are you happy for me to go? Yeah, okay. So there we have it. Um, and, and so what, what you can see is using the light, what, what you're doing there is you're removing the red blood cells. So what we're trying to do with this now is to, to take these two different regimes into a flow-through system where we're using one, one um, set of conditions to trap the parasites and the other set of conditions to, to uh, cleanse the red blood cells out. And in fact, just the very fact of wanting to cleanse red blood cells out is a, a, a very important potential diagnostic in terms of looking at a, a variety of different infections and in fact treatment to infections. And so you can see red blood cells lysing here and the larger white blood cells which exist at a, a, a ratio of about 1 to 10,000 being left behind. So that's a, an alternative technology there. So just at the end, bringing together this sort of sound and vision, um, we have a, a, a slightly different idea now, and this really is work that has been done in the last week or two, where we have our superstrate, which forms a channel. We have our surface acoustic wave here, and uh, this, this saw device it has no longer got parallel interdigitated electrodes, you'll notice. It's actually got slanted electrodes. So in fact, we can define the aperture with the driving frequency so we can set up a frequency um, that's going to propagate into our, into our chip. Now, if we set those conditions up correctly, so that the saw frequency matches the resonance frequency of the superstrate, then what we're able to do is set up a standing wave, and that standing wave gives us some very nice acoustic streaming or acoustic focusing. So these are particles, these are not uh, cells yet. And then we can introduce an optoelectronic tweezer in there and either use acoustics or indeed uh, dielectrophoresis to separate the beads. So these are the beads running. In the case of the dielectric separation there, the larger beads are going to have a greater force on them, so they're going to go further. So the large beads can end up going into this, this channel here, whereas the smaller beads have less force and they fall into this channel here. And again, a, an acoustic separation, instead of relying upon the dielectrophoresis here, we again have the fact that the, lar the larger beads have more force exerted on them so they go further, so the larger beads go into these sort of virtual channels here. So we see this as a possibility as well of, of doing um, some sorting. The real challenge, of course, with this latter technology is going to be, whilst it's quite nice to play around with beads at very low concentrations, if you consider the, 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 the hundreds of millions of cells that you're going to have to uh, separate. There are going to be real issues. But I, I thought that was a nice, perhaps, place to end. So just in conclusion, these are low-power techniques. As I said, we can run 12 PCRs on a charge of a mobile phone. Uh, we're using enrichment either through separation and ly or lysis and then some form of detection afterwards with this focus on malaria, sleeping sickness, and work that I haven't shown on TB. And then, just finally, I should thank the people who have been involved in the work. So our parasitologist, uh, Mike Barrett. And in fact, interestingly, I came into this work through uh, watching my son play rugby. 
and Mike go, Mike's kids go to the same school, so we just ended up on a touchline sort of talking about, about this. Stephen Neal, who was originally from St. Andrews University, went out to Berkeley and has come back to work with us, who's helped us with the optoelectronic tweezers. Then a whole bunch of people who come from a range of backgrounds, um, mainly engineers, but some biologists in there who've helped us a great deal. I should thank the people who've been funding this work, so Alir on the real-time PCR, the Foundation for Innovative and Novel Diagnostics based out in, in uh, Geneva, and then the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation who have been helping us with the malaria work. Thank you.